Good afternoon. My name is Philip Munoz. I am an associate professor in political science and the current associate professor in the law school. I'm also the founding director of our constitutional studies program. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you this, after, this afternoon. Uh, we owe uh, a special thanks to our speaker. Um, I'm going to call up a student in just a minute uh, to introduce our speaker. Uh, we delayed just for a few minutes, in part because our speakers uh, flew in from New York this morning, flew to Detroit. That went nice and smoothly. Uh, then he got stuck in Detroit. Uh, if you've read his book, you know that one of the lessons of his book is we need to empower, especially government officials, but all people to make common sense decisions. So he called and said, uh, I'm in Detroit, and my flight's not going to get into South Bend anytime soon. My response was, well, I've just read this very interesting book. Uh, you should make a good decision and do it. <laughs> he promptly rented a car and drove very quickly, not quite following the rule of law, from Detroit, <laughs> arriving about eight minutes ago. So thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Deneen is the Potentiality uh, Associate Professor of Political Science and Constitutional Studies. He's the acting director of our Constitutional Studies minor uh, this term while I'm on leave. Uh, but Professor Deneen is at a conference and so he couldn't join us today, but he did ask me to send uh, his regards. Uh, any students here interested in the Constitutional Studies minor, it's a new minor, um, it's a five class minor. I encourage you to talk to me about it afterwards or uh, Jennifer Smith, my assistant in the back. Uh, I know many of you are minors already. If you're interested in what you hear today, I think you'll be interested in the minor. So I encourage you to talk to us. Also, after the talk, uh, Mr. Howard, uh, the bookstore is here, and they have uh, um, uh, brought copies of this book, which are for sale. If you're one of our Constitutional Studies fellows, we have a book for you already, and he'll be signing the books. Uh, I own all of those uh, up there for sale, and I highly recommend them. Um, I'm going to introduce... Uh, Megan Gallagher. Megan's a uh, political science and French major, uh, minoring in international uh, development studies, and she will introduce our speaker. Well, as he said, my name is Meg Gallagher, and I'm proud to have the opportunity to do, introduce Mr. Howard um, to Notre Dame. In trying to write this introduction, um, I actually you know, was looking on his website and Googling him, um, and I heard an interview of Mr. Howard speaking at a local radio station in my hometown of Napa, California. And I'm going to quote you here. And he says, Everyone argues about public policy, about what our goals should be, and nobody is really talking about how we implement our goals. And you can't implement goals when people are crushed by billions of words of law, and you can't get anything done. The President of the U.S. doesn't have authority to approve rebuilding a decrepit bridge. It takes close to a decade to get approved. That's just absurd. And while I agree, and as a member of Bridge ND, a new political club working to show Congress that college students can bridge the partisan divide, Mr. Howard perfectly represents our mission to approach public policy questions with dialogue that is both constructive and actionable. And if you're interested um, in the new club, come talk to me or Alice Caton in the back, one of the officers after the club. Um, Thirteen years ago, Mr. Howard founded Common Good, a nonpartisan coalition that offers new ideas to restore common sense to all three branches of the government. Since he's published four books, and while their titles, The Death of Common Sense, The Collapse of the Common Good, and The Rule of Nobody, uh, don't leave us feeling all too optimistic, <laughs> he has a concrete theory of change to reform what he sees as a broken government. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Howard and his movement to restore our government's ability to promote the common good. Uh, uh, thanks, Megan, and thanks, thanks, Philip, and thank you all for coming. I, uh, I wish uh, Professor Deneen were here because he makes the distinction uh, in his writings between optimism and hope, and while. Um, <clears throat> There's little cause for optimism. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. I think there's always cause for hope. And, uh, and especially in, at, at Notre Dame, where 
uh, sort of an iota of good values in, in our society, I think it's important to um, constantly ask oneself what we ought to be doing and what government ought to look like, even if there's no, no uh, clear path to get there. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, today generally on the subject of whether it's possible to fix uh, American government. And um, I, uh, I set out on this uh, quest uh, a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago. Uh, I had an insight I thought was actually a brilliant insight, shared by 98% of all Americans, <laughs> that uh, the government wasn't working all that well. And um, <clears throat> so I set out to start thinking what one would have to do. And I actually concluded that it cannot be fixed, at least on its own terms that there are deep embedded um, flaws of institutional design. And the, these flaws actually bear on, on a subject which, again, Notre Dame is a center of learning on, which is the, uh, I think, the broad modern confusion about the relationship between authority and freedom. And uh, we, we've tried to create a system of government uh, in an effort to make sure things work properly that is that is structurally paralyzed, we hoped that we would protect ourselves and enhance our freedom by making sure government didn't do things wrong. And not only do we make government ineffective, but we're also shackling our own freedom. So, uh, so what are the ideas out, out? Just briefly, you know, what do people say we should do to fix government? Uh, President Obama appointed the most brilliant regulatory uh, scholar in America, Cass Sunstein, to come in and run his regulatory reform efforts, and he spent four years doing that, wading into the jungle and coming up with uh, mainly really good ideas about how to fix this regulation or not, and probably fix scores of them out of about 500,000. <laughs> and then he wrote a book entitled Simpler, uh, uh, extolling the way that he had made American government simpler in his four years, to which one of my colleagues said, I must have missed that. <laughs> uh, and then there's a lot of uh, talk, uh, which I'm sympathetic to, about the sleaziness of politics, all the money in our current system and where the money comes from, special interests, uh, not so much getting new things for themselves, but, but perhaps cementing old uh, in, entitlements or, 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 or perks, and I do think democracy uh, has and probably always will have a problem of people gaming the system one way, or, one way or another. But the truth is there are plenty of people with good intent in Congress and in Washington. And I don't think the flaw is one of intent, although we could improve it there, and I don't think things would change much at all if you fixed all the problems, unless you had a new vision of, of, of how government worked. Another um, common solution is that we just need less polarization. You know, the parties have, have splintered, and therefore, if only they would get together, have dinner more often, and, and compromise, that all of our problems would be solved. Uh, there's this group called No Labels that uh, I've been associated with done a few things with over the years. I think of it as no ideas. Um, and their notion is to come together. The problem is if both parties compromise, you get half of one special interest group, half of the interest groups on one side, half from the other side, and we drive over a fiscal cliff holding hands. But it really wouldn't do much um, for the country, in my view. Then there's the Tea Party which I think is absolutely fantastic in some ways. It's populist energy about the dysfunction of government. They're absolutely right about that. I think their solution is pretty much absolutely wrong, which is let's just get rid of government to the maximum extent possible. Uh, I think in a modern, uh, interdependent world, globalized economies, we need uh, government oversight for clean air, clean water, to make sure our toys don't have lead paint on them, et cetera. And Government is actually needed, uh, if our standard, I think it should be, is government enhancing our freedom to, um, government oversight is needed if you're going to feel comfortable 
dealing with other people, not only to enforce contracts, but make sure people in nursing homes aren't abusive and the like. So I think the Tea Party's energy and their anger is completely justified. Their solution is wrong. And finally, we long for better leadership. If only we had better leaders. Change we can believe in. Yes, we can. The truth is, I argue, George Washington, if reincarnated, could not run this country. You put him in the White House, and he couldn't do what's needed. And the reason is because law has piled up, mainly over the last 50 years, like sediment in the harbor. So it's impossible, it's, it's, it's illegal to do anything sensibly <laughs> in, in our society. Instead of supporting a government and a democracy based on responsibility, it's actually law has replaced human responsibility. You're not allowed to take responsibility. So it's possible to fix American government, but only if we completely change the philosophy of our operating system. So let me get concrete, a few stories. A couple of years ago, a um, a tree fell in a creek in town, Franklin Township, New Jersey, caused flooding. Uh, the town father sent in a backhoe to pull out the tree. And then the town lawyer said, oh, it's a class C1 creek, whatever that is. And you have to go through a formal process to get approval to remove a natural obstacle from a class C1 creek. So they started filling up papers. It took 12 days and $12,000 in legal fees to get approval to do what was completely obvious which is to pull the tree out of the creek to stop the flooding. Now that's only one anecdote. So let's get bigger. Uh, 2009, uh, you may remember, uh, with bipartisan support, President Obama got an $800 billion stimulus plan to stimulate the economy after the Great Recession hit. Uh, you'll also recall that the, that the bell cow of this big program was going to rebuild America's fraying infrastructure which is falling apart. It's got a D-plus rating by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Bridges are decrepit, water pipes 100 years old, et cetera. A few months ago, the White House came out with their five-year report on the was spent. And they talked about all the great things and how to stimulate the economy. But in sort of generalities, I want to try to figure out how much was actually spent on rebuilding our infrastructure. Buried in the back of the report in a table is this number. Barely 3% of the money got spent to rebuild America's transportation infrastructure. <coughs> so how can that be? Why would they? Because the president wanted to spend it. The country needed it. All those jobs could have been there. The reason is because the president of the United States, duly elected by a majority of Americans, doesn't have the authority to approve even obvious rebuilding projects. We're not talking about roads through virgin forests. We're talking about just broken down bridges. Bridges and, and so the density and granularity of the regulatory state cannot be over, overstated. I, I tell a story in the book of rebuilding uh, the Bayonne Bridge to permit a new generation of efficient ships to get into Newark, Newark Harbor. Someone figured out how to do it without rebuilding the bridge, just raising the roadway. So it wasn't touching the foundations, wasn't touching the right of way, had zero environmental impact. In order to, to get approval to do this, they had to get 47 permits from 19 agencies. They did an environmental review that ended up being 5,000 pages. They ended up, they had requirements, they had to do things like a survey of historic buildings within a two mile radius of the bridge, on either side of the bridge, even though the project was touching no, historic, no buildings at all. Uh, they had to send notices to Native American tribes all over the country as a matter of law uh, to see if they want to participate in the process. The Shawnee Nation in Kansas, others. One did. The, the requirements are well-meaning. It's just piled up, made it so that it took five years to get initial approval, and now it's stuck in litigation by someone who doesn't even care about the environment, but is trying, the Teamster is trying to use the lawsuit as a lever to make the, the port create a closed union shop. Completely ulterior motives. 
So here you are, years going by for a project that could have been employing probably several thousand people, held up for no reason at all but the law, but the law required it. <coughs> the most rudimentary responsibilities of government, balancing a budget, basically illegal. 60% of federal revenues go to three entitlement programs that don't even go to Congress for reauthorization. The programs are important, but it turns out we can't afford them. So they need to be changed or adjusted to, so that we can help or tax raised or whatever, but to balance the budget. But no one can do it. Andrew Cuomo, when he became governor of uh, New York, had many budgetary problems, discovered there was a juvenile detention facility upstate New York that cost $50 million a year to run and had no juveniles in it and no prospect of it. So he had a press conference and said, we're going to save $50 million for the taxpayers of New York by closing down this juvenile detention facility. Then the lawyer pointed out that there's a law buried deep in the growing law books of the state of New York that makes it illegal to close any public facility with union employees without at least one year's notice. So he had to keep it open for another year, $50 million. That's 10,000 taxpayers each paying $5,000 a year in taxes for no reason at all except for the fact that some law enacted decades ago people had forgotten about prohibits the governor of New York from doing what's obviously best for the, for the New York City taxpayers. And it's not just government. All this law now makes it hard to do anything. Mayor Bloomberg discovered that opening a restaurant in New York requires approvals from 11 different agencies. The United States now ranks 20th in the world in the ease of starting a business behind a bunch of third world countries. I mean, this is the United States of America, the land of the free. So, you know, we want innovation. No, it's very hard because you have to go to 11 different agencies. It's, um, there's this recent trend by uh, municipal officials to close down children's lemonade stands because they don't have a vendor's license. <laughs> and the law doesn't actually distinguish between whether it's kids selling lemonade for 50 cents or somebody in a big truck going around, you know, serving the, uh, serving, serving the lunch crowd. It's hard to find any social activity that isn't weighed down by law. Uh, businesses won't give job recommendations because you might get sued no matter what you say. Uh, my own law firm has a rule of questions I'm not allowed to ask applicants, including this one, sort of bursting, you know, bulging with innuendo, where are you from? <laughs> uh, and the truth is, you can say anything that where are you from. I mean, you can, you know, but you can't have a rule that muzzles everyone and tell everyone how to do it just because someone might uh, do it badly. Um, teachers are crushed by bureaucracy. Doctors are crushed by bureaucracy. They go through the day with a little lawyer on their shoulders, spend 30% of their time filling out paperwork and such. Law is everywhere in, in this country. But the worst thing about it is that it's changing our culture. Instead of people being trained to ask, What's the right thing to do? Now people are being trained to ask, what does the rule require? Or, sometimes, what does the rule allow? And if it allows it, then it must be okay. A couple of months ago, um, a lifetime employee of the DC Parks Department was walking with his daughter on the streets of Washington, and he had a heart attack right in front of a fire station. The firemen were standing there, and they're first responders. And the daughter ran over and said, I think my father had a heart attack. Uh, please, can you help? And they said, no, the rule is that we call 911. And she said, but my father's gasping for breath. So I'm sorry, but the rule is to call 911. So they called 911, and by the time the ambulance arrived, 15 minutes later, uh, he had died. It's actually not an unusual story. Every couple of weeks, there's a story like this. Um, a couple of years ago, a mother had a son who was depressed. He was off his meds, said, uh, I'm going to go commit suicide. I'm just going to swim out in the ocean uh, on this beach in California, and I just don't want to live anymore. 
She called 911, the fire department, the police showed up. And sure enough, there he, there he was, the most treading water 150 yards offshore in the cold Pacific Ocean. And um, they stood there. And the crowd gathered and said, why don't you go save him? And they said, the fire chief said, because of budget cuts, we haven't been recertified for land-based rescue. So it would be illegal for us to go save him. Finally, a woman passing by dove into the cold ocean and swam out to try to save the guy. Got there too late, ended up dragging in the body. This caused some attention in the press. Uh, the next day, the fire chief was said, what would you have done if that was a young child who was drowning? And he said, I know what I would do if I was off duty, but if I was on duty, I'd have to follow the rules. So think about this. Is this what it means to live in a free country? Where people don't even think they're free to save someone's life? Is this what it means to actually run a democracy where we elect people, a president, in an economy that's, that's desperate for jobs, and the president doesn't have the authority to approve the most obvious rebuilding projects, and all the way in between? Well, there's something wrong with this picture. And what I argue in the rule of nobody is that we have two fatal structural flaws with the way that we've organized modern government. The first is that we don't have the idea that law has to adapt to changing circumstances. We treat every law like it's the Ten Commandments, even though at this point it's the Ten Million Commandments. And so maybe laws uh, like the First Amendment or contract law, basic principles of law, they don't need to adapt very much. Those are general principles that people abide by. But when you start talking about regulatory law of one sort or another, like all, like most choices in life, it has, has unintended consequences. You don't know if you wake up in the morning that a plane is going to be canceled in Detroit. You've got to adapt. You've got to do, figure out another way to get here. And that's true with everything in your life. You know, you wake up in the morning, you think you're going to do something, and then you end up getting diverted. So you have to be able to adapt. But we don't have the idea that we need to look at law as just a provisional management tool of society and see how it's actually working. We, pass, we enact a law, pass a regulation, and it sets sail toward immortality. There is not one program in our government that isn't broken. But it's not because the programs are bad, have bad goals. It's just because they all have unintended consequences. And the more detailed they are, the more unintended consequences. So a good law was a special education law passed 40 years ago, because before we had the law, we locked uh, kids with special needs in horrible places like Willowbrook. So we needed that law, and we passed it. But the law was passed in a certain way. It had unintended consequences. And so now, 40 years later, Special ed consumes over 25% of the total K-12 to budget in America. There is nothing, virtually nothing, for gifted children. There's almost nothing for early education in the budget. Is that the right balance? Nobody's even asking the question. It was just enacted that way, set sail, and that's it. It's just consuming school budgets all across the country. It turns out that our framers actually made a mistake. They made it hard to enact new laws, the checks and balances and such, with the explicit goal of making it so that we wouldn't have too many laws. But the same process is required to amend or get rid of a law, except at that point, every law is surrounded by an army of special interests. So it's exponentially harder to change a law than to pass it in the first place. It's so hard that no one in Washington even has the idea that they're supposed to change all laws. Look, they don't even look at it. I, I was on the way down. I spent an hour on the phone with Speaker Boehner's head of policy. And we were talking about regulatory policy. He called me about ideas <coughs> for the speaker. And I said, well, with all due respect, Congress has the wrong idea of its job. You know, in addition to the budget, 90% of their job ought to be looking at how old laws work. 
Forget about the new laws. It's the old laws that are crushing us, that are using up all the money, everything else. And nobody's even looking at it. Nancy Pelosi was on the John Stewart show. In this audience, I have to say, you know, I like to brag, not in public, but I've been on the John Stewart show three times now. <laughs> My children actually like me uh, because they should listen to what I say because if he's listening, they reject it. Anyway, Nancy Pelosi was on the John Stewart show this year, and John Stewart said to her, you know, these, you know what you, the kind of things you're doing with Obamacare and everything is really great, but wouldn't it be better if some of these programs actually worked? <laughs> and to which she said, no, that's not our responsibility. Our job is simply to pass the laws. <laughs> At which point he said, I'm sorry, I thought I was speaking with the House Minority Leader <laughs> and pretending to get up and leave. It was really an extraordinary admission. But the truth is, people in Washington don't even have the idea that this, this vast kind of sediment that's piled up over the years is their job. And if it's inefficient or counterproductive, which they all are to varying degrees, it's their fault that they're not doing it. So the first flaw is this idea of law adapting and changing. We don't have the idea, we don't have a mechanism for doing that. The second problem, even worse, and this is modern, that's the, the, the former is to a certain extent a problem of the framers and a problem of the nation of democracy. The, the, the worst problem is that we have this modern philosophy that prevents humans on a daily basis from adapting to the circumstances. So we can't adapt law because it just piles up. But the law is so specific that it doesn't allow humans to adapt. It doesn't allow us to be fair in the circumstances or to balance or to, or to bob here and there when, when things change. We have this idea that law can dictate correctness. That somehow we can create, if we just try a little harder, law will be like some brilliant search algorithm that always comes up with the right answer. In every situation, if only we had, had, had written it correctly enough. So the Constitution was 10 pages. The new Volcker Rule implementing one little part of the Dodd-Frank financial regulation is 950 pages. Mm -hmm. The law implementing, the law authorizing in the interstate highway system in 1956 was 29 pages. Uh, the most recent transportation bill was 584 pages, uh, not counting the thousands of pages of regulations that could follow. The 26-page bill without regulations ended up uh, promoting the construction of 41,000 miles of interstate highway over the next decade and a half. The present uh, um, transportation bill hasn't done anything yet because they'll let get approval to start. And they're so busy writing regulations, they're not, they're not in fact rebuilding the roads. So when you try to, the idea is that law should be clear. We're going to make law as clear as possible. Make sure nobody does anything wrong. What is that? Think about that. We're telling everybody exactly how to do everything. Nursing homes have a thousand rules. Food shall be no more than no less than 9, 15 centimeters above the floor. There should be 0.09 recreational workers. There should be trash cans and everything. Eggs shall be cooked. That's a rule. Um, rules, uh, literally, a thousand rules in those days for, for nursing homes. What does this look like? It's central planning. It's not the rule of law. It's not a legal system allowing people to go forth during the day and exercise their freedom to try to make things happen. It's, it's like Soviet central planning, except the planners are dead. <laughs> it's all lined up. You know, the planners who wrote this stuff years ago, and who knows who they are? Democracy really is run by dead people. All those go look in the law books. I mean, just read what, and ask yourself, who wrote this stuff? Who can I call? Who can I blame? Nobody. It's just there. It's the law. It's this big blob. And it's gotten bigger and bigger. And people feed on it, but no one's in charge of it. Does it prevent officials from being arbitrary, having all this, quote, clear law? No. 
It gives them arbitrary power because no one can comply with the law. There are studies of big companies with thousands of lawyers are generally found to be about 25% out of compliance with any given law. It's just too much. No one, and they're often contradictory. You've got to have shade trees in the parking lot. You cannot use up the groundwater in this zone. Well, which, which do you want? The trees use up groundwater. The, so, you know, so the, the contrary, but nobody's sitting there making sense of any of this stuff. And so it's piled up year after year. And now nobody can do anything. You can't rebuild a bridge. Can't do, everything's a process that goes on forever. So we have this legal blog. It's, it's paralyzing. Uh, the reason I think the parties are polarized is because they've given up doing anything. They know they're powerless. And when you're powerless, the only thing you can do is point fingers. It's a lot worse today than it was 20 years ago when I was working with Clinton and Gore <coughs> and reinventing government. And it's going to be worse in five years. And so I suppose the good news from this horrible story is sort of gravity's on our side. The stuff is grinding to a halt while it's also shackling our freedom. So what's the solution to all this? Well, the concept solution is actually easy. You change the philosophy and you put humans in charge of you. The law should be a corral. It should set boundaries of what people are not allowed to do and set goals. But within that, government officials and citizens ought to be free to roll up their sleeves and try to get it done accountable for whether they, they can succeed or not. There are lots of examples of this, both in our country and in other countries. So Germany, which is a far greener country than ours, approves major environmental projects in no more than a year and a half. How do they do it? It's so incredibly complex and brilliant. They give somebody the authority of deciding whether it's good enough or do. A politically account, imagine that. A politically accountable person says, okay, we've studied this enough, now it's time to make a decision. You don't give up the right if somebody's property rights are affected. They can <coughs> make legal claims. It's not arbitrary authority, but it moves the, moves the process along. You don't spend five years on a project with no environmental impact. You spend probably one week on a project with no environmental impact. A couple of decades ago, Australia had um, problems with their nursing homes. They had a thousand rules, all these stupid rules like the ones I talked about. Someone had the bright idea of just scrapping all the rules. And they replaced them with 31 general principles. Have a home-like setting. Respect the dignity of the residents. Serve nutritious meals. Things like that. The experts scoffed. They said, oh, these nursing home operators are going to get away with murder. If you don't tell them exactly how to do things, they're going to do everything wrong. What was the effect? Within a year, all the nursing homes in Australia were twice as good. And they've been improving ever since. And it's been much studied. It's by the same experts who scoffed. Why is that? Because people go to work, instead of with their noses in a rule book, actually looking around and saying, what would Mrs. Smith like? She doesn't like to do this. Does she like to do it this way? So they do it that way. If the regulators didn't give up their authority, they could still close down a horrible nursing home. But now they go in, instead of handing out tickets because your paperwork's not in order, or whatever, what happens today, they go in and say, we really think you need to improve the quality of your food because we've heard a few complaints from the families and stuff. But you know, why don't you see what you can do over the next three months? So it's a process of improvement rather than gotcha. The regulators become, with the families, a part of it. And the nursing homes have gotten better and better over the years because they have this positive attitude. And people feel free to actually ask the question, what's the right thing to do in, in, in the nursing homes? Uh, in, in America, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration certifies new, new airplanes and whether they're airworthy. Uh, there are no detailed regulations, like how many rivets per square foot or anything like that. That's basically, you know, there are some general principles, but basically it's just the goal that is the airworthy. And they do a pretty good job of it. They use their judgment, they go back and forth with the manufacturers, and they do a good job. Which would you rather have? A regulatory regime where the FAA uses, official experts use their best judgment? Or would you like to fly on an airplane that a court ordered to go in the air 
because it complied with the rules, most of which were probably outdated. I think everybody in America would rather fly with planes for experts using their best judgment <coughs> to have safe planes. But that requires giving the, the officials that authority. There's not, there's not an area that wouldn't profit by this. So in concept, putting humans in charge and having accountability mechanisms, responsibility, is actually not so hard to imagine. But in practice, it's almost impossible. Washington is so far gone, it is so paralyzed, it is so polarized, that, uh, that no one has any idea how you could possibly turn this ship around. And history would say you can't. History says that change happens, big change happens, only from the outside. Usually when there's incredible pressure, often in a crisis, <coughs> often when people take to the streets, you think of the, all the big changes in American, in the American, um, uh, the way we govern, the 1960s, civil rights movement, anti-war movement, the environmental movement, people took to the streets. And all those things happened because people were angry. Uh, the New Deal, people were in the streets. They were starving. We, didn't, you know, we had to change the way we, we, we ran government in the New Deal. The Progressive Era, not quite so much, but people were outraged by what they saw about uh, the way rapacious conduct by, by uh, corporations in a, in a laissez-faire legal environment. Civil war, we had a huge war. <coughs> Abolitionists took to the streets and we eventually went to war over it. So it can happen, it will happen. It happens every 30 or 40 years. We change the way this country works. And we're overdue. But we don't have a coherent vision right now. Look at both parties, there's no vision. There's no movement. And what makes the movement hard is the villain here isn't Bull Connor. It's not a racist or a starvation. The villain here is a blob. It's this giant blob. And everybody has this myth that somehow you have a clear law and it'll make everything work properly. And it makes everything fail <coughs> and undermines our freedom and the human spirit at the same time. So. So I'm not optimistic, to go to the Megan's phrase. I'm not, you know, I don't have a way, a clear path of, of doing this. Um, but I do have hope. And the hope is, I think the American culture still at bottom is a culture that believes in responsibility, that believes in morality. We need to actually approach these, this, these flaws of government, I think, is a moral problem. It's immoral that we're wasting money on programs that don't do anybody any good. It's immoral that we're mortgaging the future, making you pay for health care of senior citizens today. It's immoral. <coughs> we ought to figure out a way to, 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 to live with our means. It's immoral that, that teachers and doctors feel crushed. They can't be professionals. They can't put an arm around a crying, crying child. All these, it's immoral that you let people die because the rule says you should do it in a different, in, in a different way. It's not a practical issue, it's, it's a moral issue. It will require a complete recodification of our system of government. And so the hard thing I'm saying here is you can't fix this by getting a new leader. You can't fix it by having somebody change this and that, reform this and that. Because we have a whole system of government designed to prevent anybody from taking responsibility. That's what all those words of law are. You can have every government program that we have and have 2% the number of words if you gave people responsibility. All those law books and regulation books are filled with requirements designed to avoid responsibility, not make gold, not for clean air, not for better nursing homes, it's to tell everybody how to run a nursing home. So we're going to have to have a recodify. It's actually not that hard. Uh, we did it in the 1950s with the uh, Uniform Commercial Code in America. It always happens the same way. You know, give a small committee the job, they come back with proposals, it's debated, and it's an We have uh, the Uniform Commercial Code, uh, one of the foundations of the post-war economic boom. It allowed people to do interstate commerce without having to hire 48 sets of lawyers, because every state had different contract laws. Now they have the same contract law. It was easy. It, it enhanced freedom by having a Uniform Commercial Code. It happened in ancient times with Justinian, 
uh, uh, redoing all the Roman law, and Napoleon famously did it, his greatest accomplishment. Every time there's a recodification in history, it has been like replacing a muddy road with a paved highway. It's unbelievable how much energy goes forth that people know where they stand and they think that they can, uh, they wake up in the morning and they can actually look at where they want to go and work hard instead of looking over their shoulders and are stuck with their nose in the rule book. So it's enormous benefit. It's really hard to try to convince, to get the movement going to do it, but we don't have a choice. The system is going to grind you up all the It is grinding you up. The way you get your job, your first job, and see how much time is spent doing stuff that doesn't make any sense at all. Well, just to you know, multiply that uh, across the country. So the simple message here, harsh but simple, is that American government's broken. Everybody knows it. There's a way of fixing it. It's the way everything's always been fixed in all of human history, which is that humans relatively can take responsibility. Never in human <coughs> history has anything actually gotten accomplished by someone following a rule. Never. Rules can prevent bad things from happening, but they don't actually create new things. So if we want things to work, we're going to have to give people's humans responsibility again. And that requires completely rebuilding our system of government. Thank you. We have a bit of time for uh, questions uh, and answers. Um, at the Con Studies program, we have a tradition, which is uh, we like our undergraduate students to ask the first question. And those who do ask questions, if you uh, stand, we have a crowded room so everyone can hear you. Tell us who you are, your name, and your, your major. Or, or and when you got out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> we can go ahead. Hi, my name is Lincoln Robinson. I'm a senior political science major. Um, so there, recently there's been a lot of talk about sunset provisions in laws so that they fade out after a number of years or a given amount of time. Do you think that could help You know, the, with the issues we've got now, or do you think we just have to close our scratch. Uh, no, I think it, I think it helps going forward, and it would be a help even without doing what I'm suggesting. But there's so much, you know, the the jungle is the, mix the metaphor. The jungle is so so thick and so dense that occasionally <coughs> having trees die is not going to fix the problem. At the end of uh, the book, uh, I have a, I propose what I call a bill of responsibilities. You know, five amendments in the Constitution. And the First Amendment is a sunset provision. That all laws of budgetary impact have to expire every 15 years and can't be reenacted until an independent commission has come up with a report about its effectiveness and such, and there's been a chance for public debate. Otherwise, history shows that legislatures just reenact everything, because that's the easiest way to do it. Hi, I'm Jarrod. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Connor. I'm a senior econ major. I was just curious, uh, in your book, do you address the relationship between bootleggers and Baptists and how that might affect the re regulatory state at all? Uh, bootleggers and Baptists? Yeah, like the idea that like, uh, like the bootleggers would be people that want things to be illegal so they can keep doing it illegally to make profits, and Baptists I, I, want things to be illegal. Uh, my father was a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we made so much money. No. Uh, <laughs> um, we lived uh, for a while in a county uh, in Moorhead, Kentucky, um, mm -hmm. Eastern Kentucky, in a, in a dry county, where the sheriff owned the bootlegger on one side of town and the judge owned the bootlegger on the other side. <laughs> so the sheriff would raid the judge's bootlegger joint and collect stuff, and then the judge would throw out the, you know, would, would throw out the. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, there's a lot of cynicism in government. I mean, all of Washington is kind of a, um, um, a set, I'll tell one story, cesspool of cynicism. Uh, common good, commongood.org, it's free, sign up, give us your ideas. Commongood.org, this, this not-for-profit I have. Um, 
when actually we may be looking for student interest. Uh, Common Good uh, had a joint venture with the Harvard School of Public Health to design a new system of justice for health care, which basically expert health courts to to get to save $100 billion a year in defense of medicine and also to improve the culture of health care so doctors would be open with each other and with patients without being scared of lawsuits. So everybody was everybody responsible was in favor of this. The patient safety advocates, uh, uh, Obama was in favor of Romney, you know, everybody's in favor of this. Communist newspapers came out in favor of it. Um, it was, uh, uh, but the trial lawyers hated it, and they own the Democratic leadership. So Harry Reid wouldn't let anything, let anything happen. So when George Bush was George W. Bush president, I went to the White House and said, "The trial lawyers are stopping us, but I can I can get you a proposal here. You're going to look great. I'll get Bill Bradley and people like that to come say what a great idea this is." And they basically said to cut the discussion a little short, "No, we want to propose a reform limiting damages." that actually doesn't solve the problem, that we know will never pass so that we can blame the other side for not solving yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. They told me that at the White House. I think that should be a capital crime. <laughs> it should be executed. Yes. Or not. I mean, it's just it's so cynical, it's unbelievable. I mean, it really is like House of Parks. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, so, um, but again, history would say all change comes from the outside. So, yeah, there, there is a lot of what you do. My name is Tim Scanlon. I'm a senior finance major with a minor in public policy. Um, Republicans like to rail on bias in selecting experts. Can you address that concern? Uh, sure. Um, uh, it, there is bias in selecting. So each side, each side promotes uh, the. Uh, um, my neighbor downstairs just showed up. How come he didn't give me a ride out here? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, there is a bias in selecting experts, and it's really important. Uh, an important part of the book is the role of moral authority in government. You can't just give somebody a job when everybody thinks that they're just going to have their finger on the scale. So it's, it's important to have people in groups who are trusted if you're going to appoint an independent committee, or I mean a committee to propose, you know, redoing something. And if people don't trust it, it's never going to happen. Um, George, the diplomat George Kennan, who died 10 years ago, uh, a great, <coughs> great student of, and hater of bureaucracy, and, and student of the dysfunction of democracy, had a, he thought we should uh, create a fourth branch of government that had no power. And essentially, it would be a council of elders, people who are not aspiring to office, who had been prominent members of government or business or whatever, <coughs> former Supreme Court justice. You can imagine, you know, Justice O'Connor, Colin Powell, you know, Alan Simpson, Bill Bradley, you know, people like that on this committee. And the sole job of this group would be to write reports on how the other branches were doing. And the and the advantage of that is it would actually change the public dialogue. Right now, the media is completely complicit. You know, uh, Mitch McConnell or Harry Reid say things that you know are false, and the media takes it seriously. You know, as if it's a real, you know, uh, a real argument or something. You would give the lie to that. So it's very important to have non, to try to create groups of experts or whoever that, that are, at least have to, will be trusted by most people. There's always a, element of distrust, but, but um, the current <coughs> system is not set up to do that. It's everybody just appointing their friends. And it's just, you know, it's a downward spiral. Rob? Yeah, my name is Rob Beck. I'm the Director of Finance Administration for the College of Arts and Letters. Um, How's it doing? It's doing pretty well, actually. Okay. Um, you brought back a lot of uh, old memories that I had. I spent almost 20 years in the nursing home business, so I could uh, have a lot of first-hand stories that you just sort of confirmed. But my question is this. Um, I think most of us in the room would agree about the, in, the crushing insanity of regulations today. But there's a certain comfort that most people in the country take in laws and rules. And I think before any kind of serious change takes place, we have to figure out how to um, 
get people to stop fearing so much? And I'm wondering if you have any comments on how are we going to get the populace over this sense of fear that we need rules in place? Yeah, it's a really, a really incredibly important point. He says, and the answer is a combination of crisis. We got to do something differently. You know, we can't afford it or whatever. Um, and by the way, the history of crisis is not good. It generally ends up with things like the Arab Spring, <coughs> and the French Revolution. The American Revolution was an outlier. Um, so it's good to have a kind of a plan B in place, you know, when the crisis comes. Part of our role, part of our mission, self-appointed, is to create a different vision that would actually support democratic decision making, not be totalitarian, just not give us a you know dictator of some sort. Um, it's hard, and and you need a combination of leadership who earns people's leaders who earn people's trust, as opposed to leaders who just try to make the other side look bad. So who are those people? I think President Obama actually did have moral authority at the start. I think he, for longer discussion, I don't I don't think he has been a great president, and I don't think he really understands how the world works. I don't think he sees the world in terms of humans on the ground. How will this affect? how a nurse or a doctor or a teacher, you know, do their jobs. I think that's a fatal flaw. But I think he meant, well, in moral authority in that sense. Uh, Jeb Bush is on the stump right now quoting my book. And, but <coughs> Jeb Bush is also saying things that conservatives don't like. And I think that's important. If you want to be a leader, you have to actually say what you believe and have people believe that you believe it. Mike Bloomberg had that. He had so much money. He didn't care what other people thought, you know. Uh, and that was sort of an advantage. So it is, getting past distrust is really hard. And people say they want to rule. But if you sit in a room with a group of parents or teachers and you look at how the rules have made it impossible to run a school, don't come around. You just have to get them in a room together. Uh, yes, you talked about the yeah, Tell us your name. Alexander Robinson, I'm a first year uh, law student. You talked about the both paralysis and polarization at the federal level. What about the state level? Can you start getting like a recodification at the state level and maybe that will snowball to something at the larger federal level? Extremely good point. Uh, uh, it's um, states and localities to a certain extent are hamstrung by federal law to the things they can't do, but there's a lot they can do. And there are a few governors of both parties who I think have the potential. So in Wisconsin, Republican Governor Scott Walker, if he gets reelected, they've already called up Common Good and asked if we could come in and do a study of obsolete laws in Wisconsin and help them do a sort of cleaning out. And if they did that, that would be great. There's someone running for, for likely to win as governor, a Democrat, governor of Rhode Island, um, incredibly accomplished woman named Gina Raimondo, who's about 18 years old, and she, uh, <laughs> I mean, she, to me, it was in her 40s, she's a Rhodes Scholar, incredibly accomplished person. She can finish every sentence on any of these issues. She sees it so clearly. She would take it on, you know, without any question. So we can, we can do things on, and I, uh, so some people, um, uh, so I just, I told you, I got off the phone with, with Speaker Boehner's office, we're going to send them some bills, some clean out obsolete law bills in specific areas they've asked us for. Um, uh, a state agency, a big state agency, has asked us to completely redesign their procurement laws. They spend $10 billion a year, probably waste about $3 billion mm -hmm. the way it's done. We're going to, you know, we're going to redesign it. So, yes, if we could have a few accomplishments, it'd be helpful. James? Uh, James Hussing, I'm a grad student in political theory. Um, and I found a lot it's interesting. It's your fault. <laughs> so this place is fault for paying me. But uh, <laughs> I found your talk really interesting, and I had a lot to. Uh, there was a lot in it that I agreed with. But would you feel? And this might show part of the pro part of the problem, part of the difficulties of getting the sort of thing done that you would like to. Do you think I would be mischaracterizing a lot of your proposals, especially in the concrete effect that they would have as being proposals to create? a more powerful bureaucracy, less bound by rules and laws? Um, 
No, actually, I think it's, I think it's a more responsible bureaucracy, bound by goals and principles, but more accountable, and in that sense, uh, less powerful. They're not able to come in and say to the nursing home, I want you to serve caviar, just because there are no specific rules. The nursing home will say, that's ridiculous. We can't afford to pay caviar. And, the, and there's nothing the person's going to be able to do about it. They don't have arbitrary authority. So, and if there's a dispute over it, it gets kicked up there to a court or the like. Um, and I go through a lot of examples. If you look at successful schools, the, this is something the people at Notre Dame are so smart about. Uh, Alastair McIntyre and Deneen and all these people here are like the few people in the world who talk about the relationship between authority and freedom. The irony of authority is if you give people provisional authority that says check, you know, that has other people that are accountable to other people, it empowers everyone else. The teacher is empowered if the principal has more authority because the because the principal can then say, it's fine not to teach that this week because you have a new opportunity to do something. If the principal doesn't have that authority, you can't do that. So in fact, authority is like red lights and green lights. When you've got a crowded society, uh, you, you having people who can say yes and no, yes, rebuild a bridge, no, 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 is, it doesn't mean you always agree. <coughs> but enable things to move forward. If you don't have the red lights and green lights, you have what we have, which is red lights. And, well, finally, I'll say about this, it creates conflict. What I'm suggesting creates conflict. People have arguments all the time. That's not right. Well, that's what I've decided. That's what I'm, you know, all the, great. That's what democracy is about. It's about conflict. And if you really think the person's wrong, elect somebody new or get them to appoint somebody new. We don't have any conflict now. We just have parsing of words. You know, when people say, oh, I'm going to read the rule my way, you know, and that sort of stuff. It's, so, no, I don't think they have more power. They have more freedom to accomplish and less freedom to do ill, what I would argue. Yeah. I have one or two more questions. Oh, sure. Hi, um, my name is Allison Letty. I am a mechanical engineering and sociology uh, senior. That's and a funny combination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm all about infrastructure, so that's why I think this is interesting. Um, but I had a question. Going back to your initial example about um, you know, if you're interviewing someone for a position in your firm, uh, you know, you have to be careful about what questions you ask. So sort of in that same vein, I'm curious about, uh, you know, what are the circumstances when we get too far, when we, when we have too few rules, too few regulations, and people's uh, either unconscious biases or, or, you know, sociological factors, that's kind of yeah. where we're coming from. And what happens when those uh, might take precedent? Well, you know, a lot, I, that's a very good question. And it, one of the reasons we're in this mess is because people's unconscious, but you know, we've had social values that were terrible. They were racist, they were sexist. They were terrible. So we had a conflict. And that conflict almost necessarily results in somewhat clunky laws to try to change the culture. So it's now been roughly 50 years since those con conflict started. Doesn't mean everything's perfect now, but we're a lot further along. Now the question is, are those same laws and rules, you cannot ask this, productive or counterproductive? And ultimately, um, you know, I think you can't make everybody a good person. You can judge them, and if an institution is institutionally bad, you know, like patterns or practice of never promoting women or whatever, you can hold those people accountable because there's kind of an objective basis. But at some level, I think it's counterproductive to try to press it down, where people say, I must have not gotten that promotion because I'm, pick it, you know, a woman or minority and something. It becomes then kind of counterproductive, and people stop being candid and honest. You don't have spontaneity. Spontaneity always will, will result in some offensive comments. It's a free society. You know, if somebody's really offensive, fire them. You know, so, so I think what's happened is that we've pushed, we had to have the conflict, we had to have pretty uncomfortable rules, you know, to change the culture. And then the question becomes, when do you ease up? Not because you, not because of mission accomplished, because there's still hidden racism and hidden everything, but because they become counterproductive. And, and I think at some point, 
you've got to start letting people be jerks and holding them accountable by firing them rather than trying to have a law solve all those problems. I'm going to take the privilege of asking the last question. Um, I'm going to preface it by saying, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> remember, I've worked in a law school. So you wrote a book with the title, uh, Life Without Lawyers. Yes. That's bad for business, at least over in law school. Uh, we have lots of aspiring lawyers. You yourself are a lawyer. Yeah, but my career's over. I've made all my money. <laughs> <laughs> they discern whether to go to law school and enter the legal profession? Okay, really, really important question. Um, uh, Life Without Lawyers is, is a book not trying to get rid of lawyers, but getting rid of lawyers in our daily lives. Teachers shouldn't have to worry about lawyers. Doctors, by and large, shouldn't have to. They should be focusing on, on making people, you know, um, caring for people. Uh, so we have way, laws pushed, apropos of the last question, far to, is pressed far too down in daily life. One of the effects of that has been to actually diminish the professionalism of law. We've become like bad accountants, parsing words but without any logic to it, you know, because the words are all randomly piled up. There's no system of law. It's all just this junk pile of stuff, of well-intentioned stuff that keeps thrown on top of each other with no coherence in it at all. And it makes being a lawyer, people ask what you do, and I kind of avert my eyes, I'm a lawyer. Um, because even though when I started law, it was a distinguished profession, and when I grew up, the lawyers were important people. Today, you know, people will make fun of you sometimes for a lawyer. But in fact, law is incredibly important in an interdependent global world. Government is incredibly important. Everything I'm saying, which I think is inevitable, although I don't know how to make it happen, means that there's an enormous need for, for creative lawyers to figure out how to remake these systems, and a need for responsible lawyers to actually go into government and take responsibility to make regulation work fairly and sensibly. So it isn't, today if you join the civil service, uh, you might as well be on an assembly line. You have no freedom whatsoever. And as a result, a lot of good people don't go into government. There's studies of this. If people had more responsibility, then all of a sudden, it would become distinguished and important to become a government official. So I think what I'm saying will actually enhance the importance of law, <coughs> enhance the role of lawyers who have good values and good judgment in our society, both in remaking it and, and in applying it. So I think being a lawyer it's important not to go out and make a bunch of money, you know, doing this and that, although there's a role for that too. But in the public sphere, the role of lawyers, the demand will go up. Not down. Thank you all for coming. signing books. Books are for sale. If you're one of our student fellows, we have a, a book for you. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at the book. And if you uh, decide to purchase a copy, we can get that uh, signed for you. A few, we have a few friends here uh, today that I, I'd like to recognize. Um, let me begin by recognizing uh, Jennifer Smith. Um, she's the Constitutional Studies Program Assistant. Uh, she, uh, to the extent that uh, anything uh, happens on time, it's because of her. So thank you very much. Uh, and then we have a very uh, special uh, set of guests here. Uh, the program in Constitutional Studies is the David Potenziani Program in Constitutional Studies. Uh, David was a uh, Notre Dame graduate. Uh, he graduated before uh, I came to Notre Dame, so I didn't have the privilege of teaching him. Uh, and uh, he died at a tragically young age. Uh, this program uh, is dedicated to his memory. Uh, David loved uh, the study of the American Constitution uh, is something he's passionate about, and our program takes inspiration from his interest and his, his um, uh, the love of, uh, that he exhibited for the Constitution. Uh, David's family is here with us. Uh, so it really it's uh, touching to me to introduce uh, Frank and Cheryl, uh, Potenziani, uh, David's brother Greg, 
uh, James's uh, brother-in-law. Uh, this family has been so good to Notre Dame. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, many of you know the Student International uh, uh, Business Council. Uh, that's something that uh, Frank and uh, Fred Botek, another friend, uh, started here celebrating its 25th anniversary in Notre Dame. Uh, and the recent uh, project in David's memory has been uh, the Constitutional Studies Program. So along with thanking uh, our uh, speaker, Mr. Howard, uh, please uh, join me in uh, exhibiting my sincerest thanks to uh, uh, Frank and Cheryl Potenciano.